Hey, I'm Will Laviste. He's Eric Laville. You're tuning into Laviste and Laville, telling it to you straight the way it is from a black male's perspective. So let's get right to it. Today's show, Black Athletes and Activism. So, Eric, you know, throughout our community, throughout the history of African-Americans in this country, the athlete, the entertainer, but we're talking specifically about the athlete, absolutely played a role in activism and fighting for freedom, justice, equality for black people. Because oftentimes it was the athlete that had the national visible platform in order to stand up. And so dating back probably you probably say maybe the earliest one was Jack Johnson, the first yeah. black relay champion, 1910. Even though Jack had wasn't exactly, you know, a black revolutionary right. in the sense of Muhammad <laughs> Ali was a black revolutionary. Jack Johnson stood up and was one of those, I'm not taking any mess from anybody. Absolutely. But he's most known, you know, you, you hear from talking about how he uh loved to to frequent himself with white women and, and yeah. flaunt it. But to understand that in that time, 1910, the way black men and women were just getting lynched, there was real yeah. segregation. Yeah. Folks was treated as if there was absolutely no rights at all from every every uh, institution within every, our country. All in the day and age. So for him to be flamboyant in that way was a political statement in and of itself. He's like, yeah, I'm the baddest man on this planet and I'm a black man and I'm going to let Absolutely. you know that. So we have a heritage of athletes uh, being activists in their way. And it seems like over the years, as we celebrate Black History Month, we find ourselves right now, again, very much in an activist moment. And our athletes are playing a key role in that, too. Again. Well, uh, you're absolutely right when it comes to the former heavyweight champion, uh, the great Johnson. But uh, when, when you talk about that time period, I think you got to go back a little bit further. You know, the first really super world athlete, Major Taylor, in cycling. Now, I know cycling isn't exciting. Uh, cycling is, you know, you're going around and circles on a bike. But at that time period, you know, those were the fastest men and the most exciting sport at that time mm -hmm. around the world. So when you talk about 1890, around that time period, Major Taylor going around the world, being a representative of African Americans and Black people in America, and showing excellence, you know, that's a piece of African American history that we don't see with activism, as we look at quiet activism, and nobody would actually team with him to ride. But then you get into Jack Johnson. Well, well, even before that, if you want to throw in the Black jockeys that came yeah. before him, I mean, you know, the the... Churchill Downs, the Kentucky Derby. Kentucky Derby. You know, Absolutely. when you go there now, you, you don't see any black doc jockeys. But in those beginning times in the 1800s, you know, the slave masses had their, their the slaves yeah. taking That's care right. of horses and riding their horses. But go ahead. Go, go forward as you were talking. Hey, look, you're exactly right, because the most skilled riders were African-American slaves at that time. Right. As a matter of fact, the first 12 winners of the Kentucky Derby were black jockeys yeah. and the trainers. As a matter of fact, my father has an uncle who's passed away, but he used to train horses and break horses. And we went out to visit him when we were very little and see what he does. And it is it look, it's a very challenging uh, uh, profession. And it's not the most glorified, but I'm telling you, it is an art form. And we got a lot of African Americans that have trail and have, have broken uh, barriers in many facets of society. And we talk about sports, we talk about, I guess, horse riding. Uh, we're talking about cycling and then boxing. To be the heavyweight champion of the world at that time, hmm. that, I mean, you were the man. I mean, yeah, yeah. it was the premier position. We can go all the way up, you know, to Joe Lewis. We can, I mean, Rocky Marciano and, and, and all the fighters, and all the way up to Muhammad Ali, Mike Tyson, and others. You know, where before Muhammad Ali, the heavyweight champion of the world, really represented America. Right? That's right. That's right. And that's why it was so important uh, that who Jack Johnson was represented who he represented. He said, I'm just not going to represent America. I'm going to represent African-Americans. So riding around, flooding his, his, as they say, flooding his wealth, right? Riding around with dating white women and so forth. White America was not happy about it at all. And he could have faced lynching if he was down in the South. 
you know, in all those states where he could be caught up in Lynch. And he was making a lot of money for people. So, you know, that that, was, that was a buffer, too. But but like you said, he was the symbol of, you know, American exceptionalism. If you were to chant your nation's chant, you represented your nation. So to understand what was going on at that time and to have a black man who's the baddest man. And again, it was he was knocking cats out 15 rounds, <laughs> 20 round fights, some fights. It wasn't the rules like they got now. No, 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 no. And no. He, he, you know, you see some of them old films, they just like they fight to the death in a ring under an intense heat. So he was clearly the baddest man in the world. So to to have a society that's saying the black man is is just above an eight and to have, you know, your heavyweight chant, and he was able to speak. He was, he, he was well spoken and he was, Absolutely. you know, a superior athlete, was a death blow in many ways to the lie of white supremacy, which was prevalent in America as it is today. You know, and then let's look at Jesse Owens. So let's fast forward about 20 years after uh, Jack Johnson. Right. You got Jesse Owens at, at The Ohio State University, who is basically facing uh, pressures there now being, again, the superior athlete in the world. They're saying, hey, we want to go, you know, you run against Germany and Nazi Germany. And he's seeing the conflict there. He's like, I'm, I'm experiencing the same thing here. And you want me to tear down a society? I mean, what is America going to say? Right. Are you going to actually do the same thing? But he went. He represented the United States uh, valiantly with great poise, professionalism, and he destroyed. Again, the ideology of white supremacy of, right. of, of, of Nazi Germany, right? So Hitler, that idea was thrown out the window after he destroyed the Aryan nation. Uh, I mean, in, on their turf, on their, in their home turf, absolutely. in their country, he, he destroys this ideology. Absolutely. And we haven't seen anything like that since Hussein Bolt. Now, I'm going to put a pin in there, you know, hats off to Carl, uh, Carl Lewis who I think was one, one of the greatest uh, Olympians ever. Uh, but what we saw with Hussein Bolt itself, and uh, I got to mention him because my wife is West Indian Jamaican, so we go back and forth with track and field. Right, right. we want you to have a good evening now. We don't want, you, we don't want your evenings get messed up because you said something about <laughs> omitted Hussein Bolt. Yeah. Absolutely. But what Jesse always did, man, was phenomenal. But then right. when he came back to America, he was treated less than human, right? As a matter of fact, he could not even go through the front door of the hotel where he was being honored hmm. for his winning. It wasn't until somebody who was connected to the celebration, who was white, said, no, this is just he comes in. So he had to tell a white but a bellman, a white male bellman, who was probably younger than Jesse Owens at that time period, that even though you're an Olympic champion, even though you destroy the ideology of the Aryan nation and Nazi Hitler in Germany, right. Right. You come through the front door, you got to go through the back door. But even a bigger slap in the face, Will, with Jesse Owens. The president. Talk about it. Oh, my gosh. Look, I, I don't want to even go there just yet. I'm going to let you talk. <laughs> about that. But, you know, we, I, you know, my focus is on education and economics, community, education, economics. Right. And after doing something like that, you would think if he was white, Man, look, there'll be statues in every town of something like that, right? He'll probably be on Mount Rushmore. But he was relegated to racing horses. Hmm. See the great Jesse Owens. Pay a quarter, pay a dollar to race a horse, right? But still, he represented himself with dignity and African American community, with professionalism and great poise. So let's move forward. Talk about Muhammad Ali in that time period. You know, look at what he did. And you have a different you have a different perspective on Muhammad Ali and what he represented during that time. And of course, you know, in, in your coverage in media and journalism. But Muhammad Ali said, listen, I'm not going to be. And he really could have been right. like Jesse Owens. Right. Yeah. But he said, I see something more and something greater that I got to represent. He said, my people. You know, so you see athletes that are now uh, just like in the vein of of Muhammad Ali that are speaking out against social unrest. And I th and I think the beauty of Muhammad Ali comes with, in a lot of ways, 
understanding and seeing what happened to the brother before you. So I mentioned, you know, we were talking about Jesse Owens. So when he comes home after that great victory, our president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, didn't even invite him and other black athletes to the White House. I mean, you would think we're in the midst, we're in the throes of World War II. We're fighting this ideology. We're still fighting it with segregated troops, okay? But this it, it reveals the fight, the internal fight that's still going on in America that we see still revealed today. So he has this great victory on behalf of representing the country like a good citizen and then comes home and he's not even uh, invited to the White House. It took until, it wasn't until, I believe, uh, 2016. Or, yeah. No, actually, right. actually 76. Actually, 76, when he was finally recognized the with the Medal of Freedom at the White 76. I mean, look at look at how many years. So Muhammad Ali, again, being a wise man, looking at what happened to those before him, looking at what happened with Joe Lewis, who also was enlisted, and they used Joe Lewis to encourage other people to become enlisted men and so forth. And Joe Lewis was such a hero to Black people at that time. Black folk, you know, I'm sure your grandparents parents tell you about how folks was huddled around the um, the radio oh, listening to Joe Lewis fight. And when he would win, how impactful that was for the community. So now you fast forward to, to Muhammad Ali, who has seen all of this and said, wait a minute, I see how you, America, you misuse, how you um, essentially exploit us and then don't even treat us as the citizens that we deserve to be. I'm not going over there and fight no being being con is sure, what he said. Right. No, no, no being con and it, it, you know it does any it's done anything to me. It's called me, you know, nigga. So he had that benefit, and that's one of the things that I see that's that that is beautiful in some of our athletes now, like you see Kaepernick and others, seeing what has gone on before them and understanding their role in the heritage in this in this. This line of athletes who have the platform and should do something with that platform. But I got to ask you, what happened to your boy, Michael Jordan? What is the what? Here's the most celebrated athlete of our, you know, of, 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 of the century and probably the most celebrated athlete in American history, African-American what do you see happen to him? I know what I think. I know my thoughts. Yeah. What do you see happen to him? Because yeah. he's actually an outlier when it comes Absolutely. to understanding that heritage that we just talked about, going back to Jack Johnson and even further back. He's actually an outlier. So how do you have the most celebrated athlete in terms of excellence be an outlier when it comes yeah. to the um, heritage of the black athlete being an activist for the people as well? Yeah. So you mentioned a, a very touchy subject uh, for those who defend the Jordan legacy and also <laughs> Michael Jordan himself. If you take a look at the series, right? But, you know, I grew up in the Jordan era. And again, some of the most amazing, uh, not just basketball, but business acumen that you ever saw from an African-American athlete. And he's the first really to take this brand and trust people and spread it. Right. But he was also in a time period where there was some um, unrest in black communities. There were a lot of things still trying to trend as a society transition from African-American professionals into politics, into the corporate boardroom that he could have been more outspoken about. Mm -hmm. Right. Even when his mother asked him to support a candidate uh, in their home home state, you know, he shot away from it and really didn't speak out, speak up for that candidate. And. You know, of course, when we talk about Michael Jordan and activism, the one statement that comes out is Republicans buy shoes too, right? Right. And that was during the Harvey Gantt. The Harvey Gantt wanted to be the first black senator of the state I, of North Carolina. So, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, just imagine if Michael Jordan would have been known as the athlete that helped to elect the first black senator of North Carolina post Reconstruction. Think about how his legacy could have changed, right? Or, or been uh, uh, padded even more, right? But because Republicans buy tennis shoes too, buy shoes too, that has been something that stuck to him like glue and steel. If you watch that series, 
I mean, he's easy. You're talking about the last dance. You're talking about yeah. the, uh, the the documentary about the Bulls, their their runs and the, for the championships, and yeah, very revealing behind the scenes uh, yeah. footage and, and things, you know. But also very much choreographed. But go ahead. But it but one thing that was very hard in that segment, mm -hmm. you know, of course, uh, Michael Jordan, he's he's coordinating the series itself speaking his point and his point is eventually going to become the historical point after right. so many years. But when it comes to that point, I saw him squirming in his seat. Yeah. I saw him searching for words. I saw him in his eyes saying to himself, for me, this is what I saw. I know I messed that part up and yeah. done more, but it was so hard being Michael Jordan. Could you be in my shoes? And I think that's a point that all of us have to take. But if you look at athletes today, right, it's so hard being LeBron James, a kid who was hyped up in high school. Right. I remember seeing him. I saw him in high school, you know, uh, uh, in Chicago in an all-star game in high school. I mean, he was, as it said on Sports Illustrated, the chosen one. He, and, and to be a kid and have to deal with that at so early. At I 14 mean, I, years old. 14 years old. 15 years old. And you're, and this is pre-social media. And every right. in the country knew who LeBron James was, right? right? From this place in Cleveland, not, I mean, Ohio, not Cincinnati, Ohio, not Cleveland, Ohio, not Columbus, but Akron, right? Right. right. <laughs> An afterthought of the state for the most part when it comes to those three major cities. But this guy here now turns and says, you know what? I'm going to use my voice to speak up for people who can't speak for themselves because he had a connection to people suffering in that way. He saw that. He knew that. And he had been through some things in his life. So right. he used that to speak up. And that's one area that Michael Jordan cannot hold a candlestick to LeBron James. In. And that's one area where I think LeBron James embodies the major tailors, the jockeys of, 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 of the derby races. He embodies the Jack Johnson, the spirit of Jack Johnson. He embodies the spirit of Jesse Owens, uh, fellow Ohio. He embodies the spirit of Jackie Robinson. He embodies the spirit of Muhammad Ali. He embodies the spirit of John Carlos and Tommy Smith raising right. the fence. You know, he embodies all of those athletes. Paul Robeson. Oh, my gosh. I mean, you know. Did you forget the, the, Paul Robeson was an athlete? That's right. I mean, you know. He was, he, so, he, he was, a whole, he was so talented. Such, you know, a, a blessed human being that he was a great talent, great actor. Absolutely. Great singer. And that's the thing about it is that. Part of this heritage is that when you're confronted with that moment, every, all of these athletes, because of their platform, they end up facing a watershed moment where they have to stand and deliver. And so even though that Michael Jordan is correct, it's very it had to have been very difficult to be Michael Jordan. But guess what? It had to be very difficult. We just talked about Jack Johnson in a time where folks were being lynched. It had to be very difficult. It had to be oh, very difficult to be Jesse Owens. It had to be very difficult to be Jackie Robinson, Paul oh, Robinson, man. all of the people that you mentioned. So part of this greatness is just like how it's very difficult to stand on that foul line and sink those game-winning shots. It's very difficult. Part of what makes you great is your ability to stand and deliver in that watershed moment. And, and as you pointed out on the series, I think he recognized, yeah, I, I, I fumbled the ball. Yeah, yeah I dropped the rebound. I, I, I got – and, yes, during that time, you know, in the 80s, if you can recall the 80s, this yeah. was the time of the big contracts. You know, we see all these big contracts and we, these big branding of athletes, yeah. and we forget We're used that, to it. We're used that, to it. Right, yeah. we're used to it. But in that moment, that was – Jordan was like the – Next test case, if Dr. J, who also was oh, revolutionary man. with his yeah. fro and all of that, Afro making a statement, he yeah. was being marketed. But it was Jordan who was that first black athlete outside of OJ who was right. really being nationally and inter and he became this international uh, icon. So, yes, in that context, that was something new that. Right. He had an additional pressure to deal yeah. with. And I can definitely 
And again, and also being that it was supposed to be, we're thinking it's a post-racial America, you know, that we're moving into (laughs) and so forth. So, yes, it was very difficult. And no one, no man can really stand in another man's shoes. But if you measure it by other athletes who had to stand and deliver, you talked about John Carlos and and, and, um, and Tommy Tommy, Tommy Smith. In that moment, that is what the greatness of the activism is about. In that moment, when I have to stand, when I have to deliver, how do I stand? How do I deliver? And unfortunately, like you said, that will always be, you know, something that, as you talked about uh, LeBron, he yeah. absolutely eclipsed um, Michael Jordan. And because LeBron understands at a young age that he had a greater role and he was part of his greater heritage. And at the height of his influence. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I've read the statement that Michael Jordan wrote as it relates to what was happening in protests. He gave a million dollars to the uh, effort in Charlotte during the protests. But he's, I mean, that's good. But the influence that you have, you know, all of us have a chef life, right? All of us have a degree of relevance. At some point, we're here in our relevance and we start to decline, right? To the point where we, if you don't, if you don't play your cards right, you become irrelevant. <laughs> right, and right. We, never, we never want to get to that point, but it happens so many times. And I'm not saying that Michael Jordan is irrelevant, uh, but as, as it relates to that issue of social activism, unless he does something spectacular, he is. But now we're, you know, but, but, but now we're looking at a point where I want to go back in history, uh, what Jackie Robinson did. You know, hats off to uh, the great, the late great now, Bozeman, Chadwick Bozeman, who played that part and brought that to life and so much that he did, you know, to help bring our giants to life before, you know, God took him away from us. But, you know, Jackie Robinson, man, he was the first and he had to represent in a certain way. That's and right. he had to hold in, you know, his his anger and frustration of being called, you know, uh, uh, negative words and not being even liked in his own clubhouse. You know, until he started to become loved and embraced by the baseball community. Right. And we look at uh, Hank Aaron, who now baseball now is being uh, we, we have the Negro League players come into the league. But now you have somebody like him who, again, had to embrace uh, the weight of the entire race and also the America sport and overcome that. Value. Receiving death threats while right. he's chasing <laughs> the home run title. It's it's hard, it's hard enough to chase the title just being in between the lines on the field, oh. but having to do it under the pressure of right. death threats. So Absolutely. when you look at, again, each of these athletes, like you said, you know, another great athlete, Kurt Flood, that we don't often hear about. Yeah. He took a stand regarding free agency regarding the, the right of the athlete to be able to take their talents and go anywhere. So now we see free agency. We see all this money that's being made. Kurt Flood really didn't get to uh, uh, reap those benefits of what he sacrificed, but he stood his ground in that moment. And then now we got uh, Kaepernick, who lost basically lost his profession. But thank God he was able to see the fruition that he was right and, and and actually get to a point to witness demonstrations where police were taking a knee along with demonstrators, police Absolutely. taking a knee. I mean, this is what really what greatness is about. And, and all of us can really measure ourselves by is look, when you are faced with that moment where you have to stand and deliver, whether it's at your job, whether it's Absolutely. with your family, whether it's in a community, whatever the case is, the greatness is, can you stand for what is right, for what you believe in, and be able to withstand those consequences. And all of these different men, and we, we, we've been remiss in mentioning some women. I think about Wilma Rudolph. Wilma Rudolph. I think about others yeah. who had to perform. You look at the Williams sisters. My goodness. You know what kind of pressure they have gotten and how, what kind of hate that they have gotten, the mail, the hate mails that we've never read, but yet they still had to get their minds together and go out there and perform, that's that. That's what that greatness is about. And I think that all of us can measure ourselves by, again, when confronted with that moment, how do you stand and deliver what you truly believe in? Or do you let it pass 
you know, and because you're worried about what people think about it, you, who's going to like you or what money you might lose. Absolutely. And then, Will, now we see athletes who are now become emboldened. They now have and they understand their impact. In other words, they won't just shut up and dribble. They won't just shut up and catch the ball, run and jump and play, but they're using their influence in order to change society as we see it. You know, you have the athletes, you know, led by LeBron James in the NBA, uh, Chris Paul, who's a great advocate, Dwayne Wade, uh, and others, Kaepernick, others that knelt with him, you know, and how it's changed the narrative. We're kneeling, taking a knee during the time of the national anthem is not a disrespect to our country. It's showing our country that the country is disrespecting its citizens and that we need to rise to the occasion. So now that's been turned around where we saw a police take a knee on the neck of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. He took a knee for social justice. That's why he took the knee. And now we see it. So as you stated, you know, Kaepernick was a starting quarterback in the NFL, a starting Super Bowl quarterback. That's right. Francisco 49ers. And he lost it all to take a stand, all because he took a knee. How many of us can do that? And we got to take our hats off to those that have them. And again, you mentioned the great uh, women athletes. You know, the first thing that came to mind before you said was Wilma Rudolph, you know, and what she was able to accomplish in that time period where not just black athletes, but a woman right. athlete, you know, and how she represented with, with both grace, uh, professionalism and, and the like. And then you mentioned the Williams sisters and you mentioned all others who are encouraged by them to move forward and to do great things. And um, I, I forget the current tennis player, the young, the young lady who is challenging now, the Williams sisters uh, uh, out of uh, Korea, I'm, I'm sorry, Japan. Oh, Japan, yeah, I'm forgetting her name too. Yeah, but I mean, I think like you said, that they've been inspired by those who came before them and understanding Absolutely. the responsibility that comes with it. And that's where, you know, as we wrap, you know, and I think about what black people should do. One of the things that we absolutely must do and why even we have Black History Month is to understand who came before you that is doing what you're doing or doing what you're passionate about in the area of sports. Understanding that history, that lineage from where you come from, you know, and not just realizing that it's not just about your ability to play ball and you just go in between the lines and that's it. But there's a responsibility absolutely, that has been laid, the ground has been laid for you from previous generations that there's a responsibility for you to do. And as long as, for example, you keep looking at these college programs and you see schools, predominantly white institutions, yeah. that where their players, their athletes are majority black on yeah. the football fields or basketball courts, right? But then their student bodies are overwhelmingly white. That's telling you something about the system that we still live in. If, if they can recruit to get athletes to come to the school, why can't they recruit to get engineers, to get journalists, to get lawyers to come to the school? Yeah. So if you're going to be in that role, in that lane as an athlete, there's a responsibility that you have that's been laid from those that came before you. And Will, I think that's a perfect end to our segment. But I, but I want to call their names: Althea Gibson and Naomi Osaka, uh, great tennis players, both past and present, who are making change and doing great things. So we can talk about this all day, but we unfortunately our time has passed. And that's it for Lavisa and Claville. For those of you that want to catch us, tune in to our our social media platforms: Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. LinkedIn, and also emails at levise and Claville at gmail.com. Hats off to our producer, Ben Bailey, keeping us right and tight behind the scenes. Until, until next time, we'll see you then.